Chapter 17 focused on firms that use job order costing. In this chapter, let's take a closer look at firms that use process costing. Remember that firms choose their costing system based on how they understand their manufacturing operations. A firm chooses job order costing if it thinks of its work as discrete jobs that are not directly related to each other. So, for example, a firm that makes a variety of small kitchen appliances can assign the direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead associated with making a model of toaster ovens to job one and send the materials, labor, and overhead associated with making a particular model of can openers to job two and send the materials, labor, and overhead associated with making a particular model of blenders to job three. The completion of the toaster ovens in job one is independent of the other jobs. When the toaster ovens are finished, they leave work in process and are transferred to the finished goods inventory taking their costs with them. And when those toaster ovens are sold, those costs are transferred to cost of goods sold. So firms that choose job order costing think of their production process as unique batches. So it makes sense for them to accumulate the cost of each batch by the job. As we saw in chapter 17, a firm that uses job order costing has one work in process account in the general ledger, and that account is tied to subsidiary accounts for each job. So the firm can track how much cost went into each of those jobs. The sum of the value of all of the jobs that the firm is currently working on has to equal the total value in work in process inventory. And we saw in chapter 17 that a firm that uses job costing records the cost of each job on a job cost sheet. The costs for each job are generally recorded when the bookkeeper gets a copy of the job cost sheet, which is usually when the job is completed. By contrast, a firm chooses process costing if it thinks of its work as a series of processes that all units must go through. For example, let's say that a firm manufactures soda. It may make cola and root beer and ginger ale and orange soda, but all soda that it makes has to go through the same set of basic processes. In the first process, the mixing department, water and flavoring and either sugar or artificial sweetener are combined. Then labor and manufacturing overhead are added as the ingredients are mixed. Then the mixture is transferred 
to the carbonating department, where carbon dioxide and labor and overhead are added to make the soda bubbly. Finally, the mixture is transferred to the bottling department, where bottles and caps and labels are added and direct labor and manufacturing overhead are used to get the soda into the bottles and seal them up. When the bottling process is complete, the units are transferred to the finished goods inventory and they bring all of the costs that they acquired in each process with them. When they're sold, those costs are transferred to cost of goods sold. So a firm would choose process costing if it thinks of its work as manufacturing similar products through a uniform set of processes. Therefore, it makes sense for the firm to accumulate costs by the process, which means that the firm needs a separate work in process inventory for each process or department, and the units carry these costs from one process to the next, and the ultimate cost of a particular unit is the total of all of the costs that it accumulated in each department that it went through. These costs are summarized as a production cost report that is prepared by each department at the end of the period. And the costs are recognized at the end of the period when the bookkeeper gets a copy of each production cost report. We'll take a look at an example of a production cost report at the end of this chapter. Based on this discussion, which of these companies would be the least likely to use a process costing system. Think about it for a moment. Manufacturing various types of paper or soft drinks or petroleum products would require the same basic steps. So these firms are very likely to choose a process costing system. By contrast, clients go to an accounting firm for lots of different services, like tax preparation, or an external audit, or an audit of internal controls, or an assurance letter for a bank loan. So an accounting firm is not going to choose process costing. It will choose job order costing where each client represents a separate job. Which of these characteristics would be the same in both job order costing and process costing. The answer wouldn't be the flow of costs through the accounts, as we saw from the flow charts at the beginning of this chapter. And it wouldn't be the number of work in process inventory accounts because we saw that 
job order costing only uses one work in process account that's attached to subsidiary accounts for each job, whereas a process costing firm has one work in process account for each process. And the answer wouldn't be the method of record keeping because job order costing uses a job order cost sheet, whereas process costing uses a production cost report. The answer is that job order and process firms generally have the same product cost categories, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Now let's look at how a firm would recognize the flow of costs through its process costing system. Production starts when direct materials and direct labor and manufacturing overhead are added to the work in process in Department 1. In journal entry terms, we would debit, increase the value of work in process in Department 1 and credit, decrease the value of direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Or, if we want to simplify our bookkeeping, we can combine the direct labor and the manufacturing overhead into what's called conversion costs. That is, the cost to convert the direct materials into something that's ready to continue with the manufacturing process. This makes sense for many process firms because they tend to be highly mechanized. So direct labor and manufacturing overhead really are consumed at the same time. When the units are finished being processed in Department 1, they're transferred to Department 2. And we recognize this transfer with a debit increase to the work in process in Department 2 and a credit decrease in Department 1. Then we add more materials and labor and overhead to the work in process in Department 2. And we recognize that with a debit, an increase to the value of the work in process in Department 2 and a credit to materials and labor and manufacturing overhead. Or we can combine the labor and overhead and call it conversion costs. When the units are finished being processed in Department 2, they're transferred to Department 3 and they bring all of their manufacturing costs with them. We recognize that transfer with a debit, an increase to the value of the work in process in Department 3, and a credit, a decrease to the value of the work in process in Department 2. Then we add more materials and more labor 
and more overhead to the work in process in Department 3. And we recognize those additions to the value of the units that are being processed with a debit increase to work in process in Department 3 and a credit to materials and labor and manufacturing overhead. Or we can simplify our bookkeeping by combining labor and overhead and calling it conversion costs. There's no rule that says that a process costing firm has to have three processes, but eventually goods reach the end of the production process. And at that point, they're transferred to the finished goods warehouse and their costs that they picked up in all of the processes that they went through are transferred to finished goods. The journal entry to recognize the completion of the production process is a debit increase to the value of finished goods and a credit decrease to the work in process in the final department. When the goods are sold, we credit, reduce the value of the finished goods and debit that amount to cost of goods sold. At the same time, we debit either cash or accounts receivable and credit sales revenue. And the difference between the sales revenue that we generated from selling the goods and what the goods cost us to make is the gross profit on the transaction. Some firms always finish what they start. For example, a firm that makes frozen food or a firm that produces perfume would never leave partially finished units at the end of the workday and then come in the next day and continue with the manufacturing process. But that's not true for all firms. For example, a firm that prints and binds books or a company that weaves textiles, or one that cuts lumber, would have no problem leaving partially finished units and then continuing with the manufacturing process the next day, even if one day is the end of one accounting period and the next day is the start of the next accounting period. So the issue for those firms is how do we handle the cost of partially completed units at the end of the period? We'll take a look at this problem in the next section of Chapter 18.